Hey Tommy, would it be fair to say that this is the most anticipated new Lexus, not of the year, but of the decade? I think you're exactly right. This is probably the hottest SUV of 2024, the new Lexus GX. Now, those of you guys who've been following us know that we were just in uh, Arizona driving this. Well, actually looking at it, we did a little bit of driving, but now we got the vehicle here in Colorado. Uh, so in this video slash podcast, we're gonna do a walk around, but we're also gonna drive it and give you our first impressions after living with it. So where do you wanna start? Well, let's start with what they sent us. Okay. So. This is a luxury trim of the new GX 550. This is the expensive one, dude. Yeah, so luxury starts in the $77,000 territory. Luxury plus 81 grand. Fully loaded, you're gonna be looking at mid 80. So it is an expensive vehicle, but that I have to say, I feel very honored. Um, <laughs> Why is that? Because they sent us one of the only luxuries of all the press fleets around the country. They've all been getting premiums and we got the luxury. Now they said that we've got an over trail coming shortly, hopefully. Yeah, because that's the one I really want to yeah. you know, take off road. I agree. And it's not quite ready to hit the press fleets. This is still a pre-production unit. The over trail we're going to be getting is full production, but this is still giving us a great taster of what life in the new GX is like. Well, first of all, I think we have to start with uh, styling. Uh, it certainly makes a statement. It's bold, it's brash. Uh, it's kind of in your face when you sit behind it, you see these two giant humps and you feel like you're piloting a very uh, purposeful vehicle, Tommy. <laughs> yeah, you're spot on the money. And compared to the old one, you know, I never really loved the way the old one looked. It just kind of had this gaping maw and then it had this low plastic hanging thing and then it had the ridiculous side steps and it was a fantastic vehicle. Don't get me wrong, it was just very busy in the yeah, design. It was like a whale shark. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> this one is sleek, it's square jawed, it's chiseled, it's got tear ducts like a man. It's Look expensive. It's ready to cry out the side <laughs> of the headlight. It's expensive, that's what it is, Tommy. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, look at like even the spindle grill, which used to have like little little dainty chrome bits all over. Now it's gone full like Stormtrooper, white and black and no chrome. It's just awesome. They killed it. And we'll tell you how much it costs before the end of this video, so don't worry. And by the way, guys, at the end of this video, we're going to do something fun. I interviewed uh, um, two really great podcasters. Uh, Bloomberg has a new podcast, Tommy, called Hot Pursuit. Mm -hmm. uh, and Matt and Hannah host a podcast, and I've been listening to them a lot, so I thought, well, why don't we interview them and talk about big old SUVs, because uh, Matt just bought a Mercedes. So that's coming up at the end of this. Uh, we also talk about this some. So uh, where do you want to start? Do you want to start under the hood, or you want to start? Well, let's keep going with the design. All right. We so got a lot more to talk about. How about the wheels? Like, how could you not? Look, 22s at least, right? Right. I mean, look how big those are. It's a look, little. Wagon wheels. It's a little dub, to be honest with it you. It is a little dub. But um, 22s, you know, are kind of the new 20s, which have become the new 18s. So, yeah, a 22 on a full-size SUV now, it's nothing crazy. If you want, like, an 18-inch wheel, get the Overtrail. If you want a smaller wheel, you can get, like, a premium. It's going to save you a, a little bit of sidewall there. But this is the coolest part of the design for me, Dad. This little guy right here. That's an FJ mirror. Yeah, it's styled after an FJ Cruiser mirror. And this perfectly demonstrates the direction Lexus has taken with this, home vehicle, this whole vehicle, which is very functional, squared off, well-made. It's very cool. Well, let's face it, Tommy, if you were in the know, and if you were an overlander in the know, what you would have done with the previous generation is you wouldn't have gotten the LX, because that was way too bougie, mm -hmm. as you youthful people like to say. You would have waited for maybe seven years and gotten the GX and turned that into the ultimate overlander. Right. And Toyota got the message, uh, and if you've been watching our coverage, you know that there's an overtrail version of this, which is very similar to this, except for one big detail. What's that? What is it? It's missing the rear seat. Hey, podcast listeners and TFL Talk viewers. I wanted to take a minute to talk to you about a quick and simple way to sell your car or truck with the help of our new partner, High Road. With High Road's online portal, you enter your vehicle's VIN number or plate, mileage, and zip code, and you'll get competing offers from several qualified dealers in your area within seconds. You pick the best deal offered and follow through with the dealer to sell your car. No more managing scammy emails from buyers on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace. No more time wasted on no-show buyers. No bait and switch with a, will you take a check excuse from sketchy buyers. Now keep in mind, these offers will be for trade-in values of your vehicle. If you want to go through the hassle of getting 
More for your car, that's up to you. But if you want to sell your car hassle free and fast, go to tflcar.com and click sell your car in the navigation menu. Or click on the high road ad at the bottom of the website if you're on mobile, or click on the column if you're on a desktop. High road makes it easy and we like easy. The third row. That's right. Yeah. That's a great point. This I one has a third row. That. But you gain the rear locking diff. So it's kind of a give and take thing. Um, now that, look at this, look, a vertical windshield, almost, almost Wrangler-like in how close that dashboard sits to the steering wheel and how upright the windshield is. And look at the low cow, cow line. I am a little worried about rock chips on that in Colorado. I, I almost said cow line. <laughs> I guess if you're a farmer, this could be a cow line. If you're not, it's a cow line. So they, we're very proud of this. Tommy did an interview with the chief engineer. Uh, so, uh, what was his name? Uh, God, I can't think of his name now. I just had it a second ago. K Kaji, Saji, come on. You interviewed the dude. I, look, if you want to see the interview, check out TFL now. I don't want to get his name wrong. But you're right, Dad. So I already did, so too late. They lowered the belt line a lot, which really raises the amount of glass area you have. So when you're driving this vehicle, you get a huge panoramic view around. And then I like this little design cue, a little F-150 here, but they kick up the belt line in the rear, which then gives the uh, impression of kind of height, which is nice. And then you got these little black strips front and back, which are supposed to be reminiscent of a floating roof. You can option this vehicle with the contrasting white or um, sorry, contrasting colored roof. So uh, lots of cool things there. And then as we come around to the back here. There's something that's not that cool. You should show them when you open up the uh, back. I'm gonna go off-roading through right. the sticks. You got that width of the vehicle occupied by the light bar. You push a little button here. If you don't wanna lift up the whole gate, you can do that, put your stuff back there. And then another big change compared to the outgoing model, which used to have the swing gate, this is now a lift open hatch. But yeah, so here's, here's the bad thing. Look at the amount of room. Well, it's about 10 cubic feet worth of space with. You couldn't fit a roller bag in here. This is always a problem, right, with the third row, unless you get something like a Suburban, uh, which has just massive amounts of room behind the third row. Here, you've got to pick kids or stuff. You're you, right you, about you can't that. You can have both. Yeah, but look, this third row is more of a temporary use third row. If you're looking to go across country with kids, in the third row, you are going to need to get the LX or a Tahoe or an Expedition or a Navigator, something like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, this is for when you're going, you know, and driving the kids around and you have to take half the soccer team, uh, you know, for ice cream, then you can put the seats up and get some more kiddos back there. You can put them down electrically. I'm going to be older than you by the time they fully fold flat. I always think that these are just better to do manually, but this being that top loaded luxury model, it does fold down like that. Now you've got, with everything folded down, up to something like 70 cubic feet worth of space. And then you also have some onboard power, 120 volt, 400 watt. And this one prong. has the captain seats. Yeah, captain's chairs back there. Mm -hmm. And then if we take a look down here, Cole, behind this little cover, we're gonna find the integrated, oh, sorry, just bumped the camera. You gotta pull these little pins, but you got the integrated hitch back there. And that's the biggest news because this thing tows a ton, Tommy. Well, it actually tows like four and a half tons, um, up to 9,000, <laughs> oh, yeah, up to almost 9,100 pounds, depending on configuration. This luxury trim with the third row, the big panoramic sunroof, it's not going to tow quite that much. But yeah, up to 9,000 pounds of towing. Well, let's, speaking of that, let's look at the payload. Yeah, let's go check that out. Let's, let's go check out the payload and see see what the, the sticker says. You know that I'm excited for Andre to get this out on the Ike, though, because... It does seem to be a pretty short wheelbase for that amount of towing capacity. So what's the, uh, what's the payload? Well, on this particular model, it's 1,235 pounds. And that's because there's so much luxury that most of the payload is taken up by things like the really funky sunroof. Yeah, yeah, you got the, the opaque to clear changing sunroof in this model. And we'll show that to you in a second. Right, you got the cool box in there, you got the cooled seats, you got everything. You got the running boards. So basically, the more stuff you cram into the vehicle mm -hmm. from the factory, the less payload you have. So if you want to tow a lot, um, you know, you need to have less luxury and more capacity. Exactly right. And you know, thinking about it, the wheelbase is, is pretty long considering that the wheels are tucked quite nicely toward the edges. You just popped the fuel filler there. I Dad. noticed. I noticed. I did the wrong one. Thank you. 
Do they still have a mechanical fuel filler pop? They do. That yeah. is very look 90s. How, look how long this thing is. This oh. thing's like, look, look, look at the size of this. I think this is because there must be like a diesel version somewhere else so that you have DEF fluid that's there could in be. or yeah. a hybrid plug-in. Because this, this has enough room for more than just fuel, right? Interesting. Yeah, good observation. Yeah. I think it's funny they're still using the 1990s third gen forerunner <laughs> um, fuel cap release, but it's it a Lexus. Yeah, if it's not broken, why change it? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so this is based, as you were talking about earlier, Dad, on the global Land Cruiser Prado series. But underneath the hood, we're not going to find the Land Cruiser 250 engine. Instead, we got the Tundra engine, baby. It's got 200 and, um, that is just totally wrong, 349 horsepower, 479 pound-feet of torque. And that's what you can feel. You can feel the torque. Now, the venerable, was it the 4.6 V8 that was in here? That is, uh, and a lot of people are going to be like, oh, no, it's got twin turbos. And I'd be like, yeah, Ford did that 10 years ago in the F-150, and the world has not stopped moving. Should we see what it looks like underneath there? Yeah, you got those two cool little air runners. Yeah, 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 look at that's that. Cool. That's quite nice. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. I wonder what this bar. Oh, that's probably just to hold the uh, little cover on. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the engine in this stead is um, largely the same as like a Tundra engine, but um, Chief Engineer told me smaller turbos. So um, I think his name was Kaji. Kaji san. No. Tommy's giving me, just, you don't have to be like that. It's fine. It's a podcast. I, I'm sorry. I don't know <laughs> so, what sometimes the... Sometimes I make mistakes. I just want to make sure that we're not... Uh, me, okay, okay. You keep talking. I'll look up the video. How about that? I, I appreciate I appreciate that. I just want to get my, my, <laughs> my, my name right there. Um, anyway, yeah. So, um, Mr. Chief Engineer, um, you are out there and you did a really nice job with this vehicle, but he said smaller turbos in the Tundra, but largely the same block made it to a 10 speed automatic transmission. And what's interesting about this vehicle is the four wheel drive system is a little unconventional by 20, well, really by any standards. It's a, it's an old school durable way to build a four wheel drive. So a lot of full size SUVs will have two high settings, four high settings, four low. A lot of smaller crossovers will be a full-time all-wheel drive setting that uses a clutch-based power takeoff unit. This uses a proper center differential with a locking function. Koji-san. Oh, you were close. Hi, Koji-san. Very good. Thank you for doing that interview with us. I apologize, Dad. I should not have questioned your uh, your ability there. Hey, you're anyway, exactly he was great. Right. He was, you know, he told us what he was a product of. If you go to LTFL, you can find that yeah. video. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's really cool that Lexus is actually uh, listening to their customers or at least seeing what the customers are doing with their cars and then adapting to it. You also have some under hood um, sound deadening there. There's a lot of attention in this vehicle focused on comfort, as you'd expect for over $80,000. There you go. You just said the price. Uh, we said it at the beginning. Did we? I thought yeah. we were saving it for the end. No, we talked about it at the beginning. Um, yeah, this is still a pre-production unit, That's... so some things may be like this. This is a good way to tell. It's pre-production. They, they put a big X <laughs> through the emissions control information. See, that's what happens when you get twice as old as you. You start to forget things. <laughs> I don't think... Uh, <laughs> I don't think that's true. I wish Dad. I was twice as old as you. You're, you're pretty sharp. <laughs> now, the downside to this powertrain, Dad, um, the 4.6, I mean, what a legendary engine. It really is a fantastic engine. Uh, venerable, dare I say it's venerable. Venerable, you're yeah. right. And they last 350,000 miles this in some cases. But might last 300,000. We just don't, we know. don't know. Fuel economy was pretty bad on that one. Like 15, 19, yeah. realistically. What's this one? Well, you, you get up to 21 on the highway, yeah. according to the EPA. But the city number really hasn't changed very much compared to the outgoing model. And just like the Tundra, there is a hybrid coming, but it's probably more for power than it is for yeah. uh, fuel economy. So Toyota does two things. If you buy a Prius, I should say Lexus, but it's the same company. You guys know that. If you buy a Prius, you're buying a fuel-efficient hybrid. Uh -huh. If you buy a Tundra, you're buying a hybrid that is used to increase engine torque and output, not necessarily increased fuel economy and i think this is what's gonna happen with this one the hybrid may be a tad better mm. uh in the city but i think it's going to be more for power and towing and you know all the good things that people like to do with these big suvs tommy well let's check out some of the rear seat space here dad all right because people do use these for longer trips look i would say hmm, this seat is all the way back and that, that, that leg room is pretty minimal. Um, you know, there's no such thing as too much space. It's 
especially when it comes to three-year-old vehicles. This is why the Suburban has been the, the oldest nameplate in America, because people just love the utility and the room of it, right? You, you, you'll never go wrong by going bigger. You will, though. Well, how so? Well, in America, is, you won't. What is the GX known for? <laughs> Off-road capability. Oh, you, I think that's something that a small percentage of people use it for. But that is the coolest part about this, is it does have a center locking diff and a low range. And if you go too big, you're really going to sacrifice. Yeah, but I don't think that's what most people will use this for. I think this is going to be a family getter. You're right. Uh, but, but you also have parking. Right, this is a much easier vehicle to maneuver and park. Um, anytime you make a vehicle better, bigger, you're sacrificing fuel economy. So there are sacrifices. Okay, so pretty small. You're right, though, Dad, in the second row. Um, now, oh, let's yeah. put up the third row. You're gonna try to crawl back there. I give you much kudos if you see. And then what happened? The reason Tommy went, oh, if you're listening to this, is he folded down the I did. second row seat, and the headrest hit the first row seat which means you can't fold the second row seat all the way down, so you have to go to the front. And now Tommy is moving the second row forward so that the first row forward, so the second row can actually go down and still won't go down. Maybe you have to lift the seat back up before the second row seat can go down. That was an excellent play by play, Dad. There you go. All right. Try again. I'm trying to see. How this works. Um, the tumble process. Uh, there is. A, is there a tumble process? I bet there is. Okay. Yeah. We're figuring this out on the fly. There you go. There you go. That was easy. Yeah. So what happened was uh, he basically pulled on uh, the lever at the bottom cushion of the chair. The back of the seat folded yep. down and then the front of the seat folded forward, allowing him egress into the third row. So third row, um, okay, we got to get the full picture here. We'll put up the little headrest. Fold that down. Let's fold that up. <laughs> it's actually pretty good. Um, third row, third row legroom is actually okay. It, it's just the the headroom's a little challenging, and your knees are in your face. But the the room is better than I remember from the program. Any USB ports? Yeah, we got um, one for each rear passenger, and we got a little bit of a little bit of recline even electrically in the third row. This is not a bad third row. You, you just squished all those orange slices that were back there for the kiddos. Yeah, you're right there. In some ways, the third row, I would say, is better than the second from a legroom standpoint. Now, the second row does have its own climate zones, if you show them that. It's yep. very nice. I always like when you can control your own temperature. Yeah, you know, being the luxury spec, right, we got um, heated rear seats and then USB-C ports back there, a couple of cup holders, and I do love the captain's chairs. Fold that down. I also love kind of that cappuccino colored leather interior. Yeah, it's really nice. It is very nice. I'm a sucker for, well, brown, right? But uh, I'm sure this has a name like cappuccino or something much more sexy than brown. Well, should we have um, a Cole hop in and take this thing for a spin? Yeah, so what we want to do, um, here, let's do this. Uh, before we do that, uh, let's do this. Let's come show them the front of the vehicle. Uh, so jump in the driver's seat, okay? I'll jump, I'll jump in the uh, passenger seat and we'll show them the front of the vehicle, and then we're going to do a zero to sixty, Tommy. You want to grab Cole's bag? No, we'll get it. We'll get it. Don't worry. It's all. It's all good. All right. Let's turn the. Let's turn the car let's, around. Let's turn, let's turn it around so we don't go left. We don't run over the camera bag. Thank you. That's nice. I like this. This is good. All right. All right. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So. Um, the, the 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 main focal point of the interior is that large center mounted screen that has just about every function built into it. So of course you've got navigation. You also have your full range of vehicle settings, off-road information as well in here, which is cool. Look, you can see accelerator and brake position. You got your, your tilt indicators. Can I tell you something uh, that I learned recently? Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, um, I was talking to a source of mine at Toyota, and they said for the first time ever, Toyota allowed America to design their own infotainment. So this was designed in Plano for America, by an American team, uh, and that's a big deal for Japanese because, as you know, Japanese often like to control uh, the destiny of their own company, and to allow the Americans to actually design this, uh, you know, is a big deal. Yeah, and they did a nice job. It's got Apple CarPlay, it's got user profiles, it works pretty well, and you still do have some hard controls for climate yeah, control. I like, I like the little rainbow colors on the inside. I think that's really nice. I love the fact that we have real vent controls and you can move manually and not going to the screen. Uh, you know, this uh, is okay. It's a little bit invasive. You know, it makes you log into it. It makes you set up a personal setting page. And, uh, and then when you get the app, it texts you all kinds of silliness. So 
part of me likes this, especially compared to the old one, and part of me thinks, you know, are they using my car and myself to go and mine as much data as they can? So if we look at the... This, this is cool too, sorry. Isn't that cool? I think this is real wood, and then you push down, and then you get actually this. I'm sure in some countries that's still a lighter, but in many places that's an auxiliary power port. If we look at the um, instrument cluster, it's also gone fully digital, and it is... Um, very configurable, so you can use these little toggles to change your different panels. So you've got your left panel, your central panel, and then your right panel as well. And it's all changeable. Save it. It saves its position, which is very, very nice. Leather wrap steering wheel. Feels great to hand. Well positioned. And you also have paddle shifters, left and right downshift and upshift. You're showcasing the, the, the 360 camera. Not particularly. I'm showcasing the fact that they actually match the car color to the, you know, color in the picture, which is nice. Yep. Uh, so you can see, uh, you can actually change that, though. Oh, there you go. So we can, can make, make it blue? It, yeah, let's make it green. Okay. Let's really confuse the next person. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there you go. Now the car is green. Um, yeah, but it's nice you can do that. Pretty decent camera system. Let's check out the backup camera. There you have that top view. Still green. Um, and then... Yeah, you can change, change the yeah. angles a little bit. You can add the lines, parking lines. Yeah, it's all very, very good. And of course, heated and cooled seats, or at least vented seats. Ventilated. I'm not, I'm not sure if they're, if they're actually cooled. Now, I do have a bone to pick with Lexus, uh, and that is outside of this cappuccino, that's what I'm calling it, leather, it's still an, a little bit of brown here. It's still kind of a sea of gray. I feel like th th there needs to be a little bit of like hmm. joy and life and color uh, to make me feel uh, less uh, serene and more happy. I think that's a good observation, yeah, and it, we've driven like the Premium and the Overtrail, and they're all a little stark on the inside. It would be cool to add a splash of color to the dashboard. Do we have a uh, rear view camera? Yep, we so sure you do. flip that open, you've got your rear cam um, function there, which is very, very good. And how about the most like uh, noteworthy, the most TikTokable feature of this car? You want to demonstrate it? Yeah, so we've got that chromatic sunroof there, so you can go from an opaque to, oh, sorry, opaque to clear. No, I don't think it's variable. There's no like middle section, but yeah, you can do that all at the push of a button. You know the first time I saw that? Uh, it was Mercedes on the SL. Yeah, the previous generation SL, or maybe it was two generations ago now, had that. And I thought it was pretty ballsy for them to put this uh, roof onto a convertible. <laughs> I thought that was only Mercedes could do something like that. So some really great things in here. Check this out. Okay. Integrated brake controller. Yeah, I love that. From the factory. Well, if you're going to tow up to 9,000, you better, I mean, you, you know, I don't know, for, for you guys out there who don't do a lot of towing, basically you need a brake controller after about 3,000 pounds. Yeah, but, I mean, Alex Lightman has a Ram 2500 Cummins, which can tow 20,000 pounds. No brake controller standard. Yeah, no Lexus doubt. Lexus GX, boom, there it is, ready yeah. to go. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, but that, I was saying legally you need a brake controller. Alex has to go with a wireless brake controller if he's going to go over three. Is it three or three and a half? Andre would know it. I'm close enough. Or get it custom installed. Yeah. Um, speaking of trailering, too, if you come over here, you can actually see we have a number of different drive modes, ranging from custom to sport S+, plus, sport S, normal, comfort, and eco. And then if we had, like, the overtrail, there'd be a button here to engage crawl control and multi-terrain select this being the more street going version we just have the auto drive modes but even still look at this down here we have a full-time four-wheel drive system to push in and you can engage low range and there's also a center differential lock awesome that, that, but, that's... but no rear diff lock you have to get the over trail uh to get the diff lock 100 yep yeah. that's a really good point but keep in mind that um even in low range, you're going to have that traction control brake base system, which will really help you get over a lot of tricky obstacles. Now, you do have a tow haul mode. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. There's that tow haul button. And then this is interesting. Remember this ECT second? Basically, uh, that's your... Uh, um, it's always been a confusing thing. It, it allows the vehicle, I think, to start in second gear, if I'm not mistaken. Electronically it's... controlled transmission second. Yeah, so it'll, that'll start it in second, yeah. which is like if you're driving in the snow and you want less torque off of the line. Yeah, this is another thing that Lexus and Toyota do. They have a lot of very, um, well, too many acronyms uh, that unless you're really a product planner for the company, you'll never know what they all mean. I would say seat comfort is very good. Nice wide seat as well. So even if you're a wider individual, you're going to fit in the seats pretty nicely. And, of course, we do have um, at least a two-way uh, lumbar support function. And then, of course, it's power, recline, forward, and as well as up and is down. Is it massaging? Um, we don't know, do we? I don't remember in the overture. Maybe if you hit the seat button. Let's 
No, oh, that's, that, that's, a, that's your little man. That's a little man. Uh, for him, yeah. Let me go. Seat controls. Let's see if we have, see, we yeah, have massage. massage yeah. Yeah, of course, it's massage. That's right. Yeah. Um, I don't like Lexus massage soup very much. So, so go back, would you? Yeah. Do you see the different modes? Yeah, you got a lot of them. They have centipede. Feels like a giant centipede. Seat. Centipede. No, no, that, that's centripetal. Centripetal. What the heck is centripetal? Centrifugal, upper body, lower body, and lumbar. Okay. I uh, don't think that the, the Lexus massage does quite enough for me. Hey, Lexus, if you're going to go with centipede, which I think is a great name for a seat massager, don't you think that's cool? Like a thousand legs all massaging your back? Just, sure. Just give us credit. You don't have to pass royalty. Just give us credit. Uh, dual cup holders, uh, Qi wireless charging. Mm -hmm. What's under there? Well, this is your favorite cool box. Oh. So push a little button. There's a little vent there. And then cool air conditioned air is going to fill up that cool box. They make a lot of noise. But they make a very clear deal not to put steak or fish in there. So if you How want. How about to, poultry? I, I, I think that's under the category of steak. So no steak or fish in the cool box. But poultry is okay. Uh, if you want more information, you have to refer to your owner's manual there, Dan. How about venison? I don't know. Okay. I, I'm, I, I'm guessing any kind of raw meat is probably right Probably out. not cold enough to store your raw meat. Yeah, exactly. And it's then it also does take away some size in the center console. But if you want the ultimate in luxury, well, the cool box is the way to go. All right. Well, uh, shall we cut here and uh, set up our solo deal and do a quick 0 to 60 and talk about what it's like to drive this uh, new GX? Sure. Let's do it. Tommy, can I tell you a little secret about this car? Mm-hmm. If you want the better ride, go for the off-roady one. In other words, go for the overtrail. Uh, you're kind of stuck choosing between a third row and the better ride. The problem with 22s is they've got like that much rubber on the side, which doesn't make for the most cushy of rides. Not that this is a bad ride, but certainly the overtrail has a much more, shall I say, wallowy ride. Well, I, I mean, I think, especially for s small bumps, the 22s do cause kind of a little jitter in the cabin. And it's, it, like you said, that it's, you're right, it's not a bad ride, but it's not quite as luxurious as, in my opinion, either the Premium or the Overtrail. And certain trims of the GX do also come with EKDSS, Electronic Kinetic Dynamic Suspension System. Very good, Tommy. I'm impressed. Good. Once again, an acronym that I would have never remembered. But basically, it's a, a sway bar system that's gone from a hydraulically operated system to electronic. So now the front and the rear sway bars can um, disconnect independently of each other or reconnect depending on your on-road situation. Now, we've driven both. In my opinion, on-road, there really isn't that big of a difference between the EKDSS cars and the, the standard cars. Off-road, there's a pretty noticeable difference. If you're looking off-road, definitely want to find one with that EKDSS, like an overtrail. Um, but look, the ride, you're right, that even on the standard premium is going to be a little better because these 22s, this is a big wheel. It's a carriage wheel. You know what I like? I like the fact that I have a grab handle here. I know we're shooting into the sun now and a grab handle here, but you have the same. Sometimes I cheap out and only give you either yeah. one grab handle or two grab handles on the passenger side, but nothing on the driver's side. You have both of them as well. Yeah, that's awesome. I, you know, I would say the, the driving experience, especially with this vertical windshield and how close you sit to it, is like an ultra luxurious, beautifully made FJ Cruiser. You know, with how upright that vertical is, it almost is like Wrangler upright. But unlike an FJ Cruiser, you've got huge side windows and loads and loads and loads of headroom. I mean, we're both over six feet, and even with that huge sunroof, it really feels like you've got a lot of airiness around you. Oh, the Solar DL just fell off the windshield. Yeah, bed. oh my gosh. So from a quietness standpoint. Watch out, this giant dog over here. It's a huge dog. It's a huge dog. Um, the cabin is extremely well insulated. Yeah, even that solo deal uh, falling off wasn't heard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it broke it. No, it was did that, not valid. If you stop it, should, will it reset itself? Oh, it there it goes. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, I mean... The... I broke it. It fell off on its own. What <laughs> are you blaming I'm me for? I didn't broke. kick it out the window. You put it on the windshield, though. Uh, right. <sighs> the user error there, Dad. I'm kidding. Um, but, um, yeah, the, the quietness in here is awesome. Even at highway speeds, super well insulated. And the build quality, Dad, as you'd expect with a Lexus product, off the hook. It's such a well-made interior. Um, if anything, I would say... It's too well made. What do you mean too well made? <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, when something is so well made uh, that it becomes a little boring. Oh, well, that's just the Land Rover guy talking there, Dad. I mean, sure, if you want to be on a tow truck, yeah, that's going to be more interesting driving experience. But um, 
this is going to get you home. All right. Well, and that's coming from a Land Rover person. Want to hang there right here? Yeah. And uh, we'll see uh, exactly how quick this is from zero to sixty. So let's stop down here, and then we'll uh, we'll accelerate. Keep yep. in mind we're in a mile above sea level. I'm in Sport S Plus. Okay. You got that ten-speed automatic I'm, transmission. I'm going to say six and a half seconds. Okay, brake torquing. Yeah. Really good launch. Really good launch. Turbos were spooled up right away. We're revving all the way up to six grand. Oh, seven and seven. 0.07, Tommy. Now that's no rollout, mile above sea level, so definitely subtract a second. A second at sea level. Yeah, if you're one of those uh, sea level types. What I'm really impressed with, Dad, is um, the torque. I'm really, really impressed with the torque at, at low speed. I mean, peak torque comes in at I think under 2,000 RPM. This is one of the, kind of the, the the things that bugs me about when folks are like, well, you know, you gotta have a V8 and an off-roader because it's got that low end torque. A lot of V8s don't make their peak torque in over, until over 4,000. This thing, just about any gear, downshift one or two cogs. All right, All right. you know that sound we're hearing? Yeah. I bet you that's augmented. Uh, yeah. I bet you that's not real. Yeah, and look, it doesn't have, the 4.6 could be made to sound incredible. I've heard them with an exhaust and they sound awesome. From the factory, they sound like sewing machines. They're not exactly look, look, a dynamic uh, sounding engine. I don't think a Lexus GX buyer is the same as a Mustang GT buyer. I think most people who buy this, you know, on the list of things that are important to them, I think, you know, engine note, exhaust note is number 10, right? Yeah, right. I, mean, I, I mean, agree. Space. You're right. Fuel economy, MSRP, reliability. You know, you can, you can do that list. And when you get very bottom, then you put engine note. Mm hmm Yeah. No, I, I, you're, you're spot on there, but we do have an enthusiast channel, and there's a lot of folks that do care about exhaust notes, even in their luxury. So, so let's let's spend a little bit of time talking about what oh. this competes against. Caution, cross traffic. Yeah. I saw that. Well, I mean, look, Dad, there's one primary competitor. The elephant in the room. The Honda Civic Type R. <laughs> you're close. No? Okay. The <laughs> Land Rover Defender 110. Yes, of course. That's and, the SUV uh, that, that um, we've and, uh, owned, and it's a great vehicle. And, and dare I say that uh, the boxy styling of this, which it is boxy, is in large part due to Jerry McGovern, who is the chief designer for Land Rover, who penned a Defender that people just fell in love with. And a lot of companies are now going away from that kind of weird, uh, like, you know, intersecting lines of designed to a much more cohesive, much more square jaw design language. And Lexus has done the same thing. And you're right, it does compete with that. I would also say it competes with the new Ineos Grenadier, which we just profiled last week. Uh, perhaps a little. I think there's- A lot. Yeah, there's definitely gonna be- um, um, Especially the Overtrail. Yeah, maybe some crossover with like Grand Cherokee L, Grand Cherokee, right? in that, that, that region, because now Grand Cherokee's can be well over $70,000. Or even, you know, Wagoneer. Yeah, maybe right? Wagoneer. That's another three-row that, how about... I mean, officially, Dad, like X5, Mercedes GLE, you know, you've got a huge range of luxury crossovers. But Q7? This, yeah, but this, yeah, you're right. This takes it a step above that <laughs> with, um, uh, takes a step above that with the capability. I think that's how I did break it. Oh, gee. Oh, oh no. boy. Oh, it's coming back. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, well we, we don't, don't need it anymore. We don't need it anymore, yeah. So, if you wonder what I'm doing and you're listening to this, I keep dropping the solar, or the solar deal keeps popping off the windshield. So, yeah, so there, there you know, this is a hot segment. I, I, I kind of feel like 2024 is the year of the three row. Uh, people have uh, decided that this is what they want. There's also the Rivian, Tommy, which I think also, yeah. you know, price wise and, Great one. Uh, you know, obviously it's electric, this isn't, but I also think it competes against this. So, you know, there's a whole slew of these, like, Three row with no space behind the not the suburban, not the you know the bigger American truck based SUVs, but the you know the ones where you close it and there's you pick between third row uh, kids or stuff. Now let's compare it to the Defender because that really is three row luxury off road mindset. Well, first of all, the Defender comes in a lot more different body styles. So Great there's point. A two yeah. door. There's you know the one one ninety, the one ten, and the one thirty. Yep. And this would be a one thirty competitor. Uh, one ten. Isn't 130 the three row? 130 is too long though. Yeah, it's gonna be more of a 110 competitor. But the 110 is a two row. This is a three row. No, I think you can get a 110 three row too. Mm, I'm, I'm not sure about I'm that. I'm pretty sure about that. I think, Someone the, I can, think the 130 is a three row. Somebody can Google it. But. Yeah, but it really it's 110, more 110 size than 130. Um, I would say that the Land Rover rides a little better. It's got four corner air suspension. This is, you know, Traditional. We're, yeah, we're, we're coil springs. Yep. Um, I think that the Defender interior is a little bit more exciting. 
I actually disagree. I, I'm not. I, I think the quality in here is better, like we mentioned. I but can, I like that design of the Defender interior. So the Defender interior has this very ruggedized, rubberized, uh, you know, industrial interior where like the bolts of the yeah. screws are showing, and it's very kind of minimalist. I've kind of gotten over that. I kind of feel like it's uh, it was cool when it first came out, and now it feels like it's getting a little dated. But that's just me. You know that this is personal preference and uh, you could be different obviously i think the engine and the the driving dynamics of this are better than the defender um, well, there's also a lot more engine choices than the defender yeah you got the four the six and the eight but yeah. comparing the inline six to this v6 i like the power delivery and just the immediate torque of this v6 a little bit more um i also i'm not see the problem i have with comparing it to the defender is i don't know how many units a defender sells but i'm guessing lexus is going to sell more yeah like i said they're going to sell a ton of these yeah uh, they sell a lot of Defenders, though, relative to... to, to it's, you know, to Land Rover. Yeah, they... they... But, but Lexus is probably going to sell more. I just feel like they, they have a bigger footprint in America than Land Rover does, especially now. The, yeah, no, it's a good point. Um, I, look, Dad, I think that this is a, a really good car. Um, I think it's a great I, car. I think they just, they basically nailed it out of the park. The, the, the complaints I have with that fuel economy is, is poor. Like you said, third... Let's, let's go to a little park over yeah, the close. Space behind the third row is poor. Um, second row comfort is okay. Those are, But those are my big complaints. But the four-wheel drive system, at least uh, we're going to take it off-road and we're going to put on slip tests, that kind of thing. But initial impressions is really good. Power delivery, excellent. Out, out, exterior design is just amazing. Comfort is really good. The refinement on the road, apart from the ride with these 22s, is really good. They just nailed it. Well, you know, like the, the upside to this is it's relatively small-ish for a three-row. Relatively, obviously, you know, there are, are smaller three-rows. I'm thinking of you, Mercedes B-Class. Remember that, GLB? Yeah, that was tiny. <laughs> that had a third row. And, of course, uh, I think the smallest one you can currently get is a Mitsubishi uh, Outlander, uh, Outlander. pretty tiny. Yeah, uh, that's got a third row. Yeah, those so, are really small. So when you, in comparison to those, this is massive. But in comparison to a Tahoe or a Suburban uh, or even you know, uh, one of the bigger German vehicles like the GLS, it's, it feels relatively, relatively maneuverable. I think if you're shopping for one of these, like the Overtrail is going to be my choice. I would skip the Overtrail Plus. I would just get the standard Overtrail. All right. How about the Sequoia, Tommy? Would you? Because that's a three row and that's yeah. also in this price range. Yeah, that's bigger. It's physically a bigger vehicle. But less legroom because you, you lose the, that you lose all that floor yeah. due to the battery. Sequoia three rows challenge. Yeah. Um, no, but it's also, I mean, what's interesting is like the, the three row, especially if you get some of the TRD Sequoias, feels feels more off-roady, even though this probably has better capability. And it's got the full-time four-wheel drive system on like the Sequoia. This is a this is an immediate yes over Sequoia any day of the week for me. Um, and how does it compare to the Land Cruiser? We just don't know because we haven't driven the Land Cruiser yet. No one has, has and media has driven it. Can, can I do an analogy for your generation? Oh boy. These will sell like Zinn, oh. right? Oh, was that the like? Oh. Oh. That's the face palm moment there, Dan. No. Well, it's better than hotcakes because that's getting a little old. Well, hotcakes is more my generation. I prefer the 1850s to what we're dealing with in 2024. So I'd, I'd rather uh, associate myself with those uh, those era. Anyway, I think they're going to sell every single one that they can make. I think people are going to just love the square jaw design language of it. I know a lot of people who are already chomping at the bit to get the over trail. Uh, at, even even you know. Look even at the over handling. The, look, at, look at that maneuverability. Even over the Land Cruiser, yeah, that's good. It's actually good? really good. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not. Fun. It's, it's not wallowy. It, it you know it actually yeah, cars. Yeah, it really well. Yeah, and then of course you know you're going to have the Land Cruiser, which could also sort of kind of compete against this too. It's got a lot of off roaders right now in the works. Yeah, they're really killing it. But uh, the Lexus brings a level of refinement that I think we're not going to find in the Toyota, especially interior quality is going to be much higher. All right, well let's uh, park it here, Dad. Yep. And we'll uh, close it up. Yeah. We'll collar down before we go over to our interview with the hot pursuit folk uh so yeah so i think uh i can't wait um to actually get behind the wheel of the overtrail off-road tommy yeah right on, on road this is you know it's fine it's 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 exactly what you would think if not better than you would think but i'm really curious to see how the off-roady one will handle Colorado off-road because as you know we've recently had some issues with the Toyota product I won't go into it but if you want to go into alltfl.com you'll soon figure out what that was and um guys let's cut to the interview you did with um 
the uh, um, Pot Pursuit folks. Yep. And then we'll see you next time. Hey, guys, I've got a really special uh, extra for our podcast this week. And that is because I've been listening to one of my, well, what has become one of my favorite podcasts. Uh, and that's Bloomberg's Hot Pursuit. And I've actually got the team from Bloomberg's Hot Pursuit on a Zoom call with me. So welcome, Hannah. Welcome, Matt. Thank you guys for taking the time uh, to join me and to kind of talk about Hot Pursuit. And uh, let me ask you, Matt, how did it start? Tell me about the podcast and what you guys do on it. Well, uh, so I'm a, an anchor on Bloomberg Television covering financial news and on Bloomberg Radio as well. And for years and years, I've tried to carve out a niche in the auto segment from kind of the business perspective, obviously. Um, so we talk about the stock and the bonds and uh, the company um, uh, companies uh, around the world. I've always listened to or read, I should say, Hannah's stuff because she writes for the luxury side of our business, Bloomberg Pursuits. Um, and she's driving all the coolest cars and riding all these awesome motorcycles. And I uh, wanted to do something, some kind of side project about cars that wasn't focused on the business of it, but more on just the pleasure of driving. And um, one of my producers said, hey, why don't you just do something with Hannah since you're always having her on your show as a guest? And that's how that's how it started. Yeah. And Hannah, uh, you know, what I love about your podcast and why I really enjoy when it pops up on my podcast feed is you guys have some really great chemistry. So do you guys know each other personally? How did you develop this kind of unique personality uh, set where, you know, it's just fun to listen to you guys? You know, that's it's really funny that you say that because I would say we've known each other, Matt, for maybe close to eight or nine years. We've sort of known of each other. We've always been friendly but we haven't really spent a ton of time together until this podcast. I think we kind of orbited each other and there was obviously mutual respect. And I really give Matt a lot of credit because this podcast was Matt's idea and it came from his team. But I don't know. We I do really feel like we're very copacetic, even though we have very different opinions about things sometimes. It actually, it's great. And it's really, it's fun. We often it's disagree. We disagree. Yeah. We often disagree, but in a good way. So yeah. I mean, I was reading Hannah when she was writing for Forbes back in the day, and then I was excited when she came to Bloomberg. But we didn't ever really hang out because we were on different floors, and then we were in different yeah. cities. So for me, one of the best parts of doing the podcast together is just getting to know Hannah. It's been a lot of fun. Likewise, likewise. Oh, it's you know there. It's funny because you see, I mean, Bloomberg's such a big company, and you talk to people all the time. And Matt is like Matt's greatest talent and skill is that he's so likable everybody loves matt wherever you go in the company so um you kind of just know people casually but um it's nice to actually spend quality time yeah it's fun because like you guys bring these two really unique perspectives to the car world which i really enjoy listening to so hannah i kind of feel like you live at the intersection of style and cars uh, and Matt, you kind of not just bring the business perspective, but you kind of bring what we try to do, which is like kind of the everyman perspective. So I love listening to uh, you guys kind of talk about a car because it, it comes from two different sides, right? Uh, one, Matt, you're kind of the more everyman approach, at least in my mind. And, and Hannah, you kind of take it, you kind of come from below and you kind of come from above and you get a really good sense of, you know, what that car is listening to both of you guys. Thanks for saying that. Uh, that's probably accurate. I, I've been accused 100%. of being stuck up. Or uh, you Not know, stuck up. somebody <laughs> has somebody has to talk well, about I'm, the unaffordable stuff. Taste. Someone has to have some taste around here, right? I mean, sure. If I have to be the bad guy, I'll be the bad guy. All right. Well, let's <laughs> talk about cars for a second because obviously people are interested in that. So, Hannah, you drive a lot of really fun and crazy cars. What's the best car you've driven in the last year? Oh, the that's one, a great the question. one that you like. Oh. You like. This is one I would. I mean, know, hard money I for. hate Matt. Matt knows what I'm gonna say, and I hate to really, you know, beat a dead horse, but I would say the 911 ST. Um, it's it's obviously uh, it's been criticized for you know the short gearbox and it it feels a bit analog and but I actually take those as good things. And of course, it's very expensive. It's almost three hundred thousand dollars, and you know the allocations are difficult to get, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're just talking about a car that is engaging and fun to drive and looks cool, I I loved it. I had so much fun in it. Um, I drove it, it through the redwoods um, up near Napa, and it was so fun. I mean, if every car was that fun, we'd all live in a happy world. 
And how about yeah, you? Matt? What's I, your what's your best car? Well, I'll just say, um, first of all, on the ST that I mean, obviously it's going to be amazing. Right. But it's three hundred thousand dollars. I mean, all 911s are amazing. I've not driven a 911 that's disappointed me Some ever are better than others. Um, Some yeah, are better than others. I, I was lucky enough to buy one in 2014. I got a 991S that was used. I found one a year old with like a thousand miles for 30% off, uh, which was, which is great. It's one of my favorite cars, but they're just so expensive and it continues to ratchet higher and higher. Um, you know, one of the best cars I've driven the last year, Roman, was the Carrera T, which is the supposed to be the affordable or at least the stripped down version of the 911. But Thank when you, you man, when you option it up, it's still one hundred and forty thousand dollars, which is just to me, it's just too expensive. Um, I, if you have the money, I, I get it. But I, I just don't understand why Porsche charges so much for the cars. But frankly, if you look across, um, you know, of any variety of vehicles, they're all that expensive. I think the best car that I've driven in the last year or the one I'm most excited about is the. Chevy Silverado 2500 HD ZR2 with the Duramax. Um, it's like a giant luxury truck that can do some off-roading. And it, that thing is over a hundred grand when you put it all together. Yeah, I keep thinking to myself that like uh, trucks can't get any more expensive <laughs> than they inevitably do. Uh, so let, let's talk about the Porsche for a second. So I was at that program where I got to drive those two Porsches that went up the volcano. Did you do that too, Edith oh, and Doris? Sure, of course, Edith, Edith and, and Doris. Yeah, the Edith and Doris. So by off-road one-offs. Yes, uh, yes, by I the time did. I got, I got to the SD, I, I was pretty injured because apparently Roman Romain Dumas drove one of those two, and he's a very small Frenchman, and I'm a very big Czech guy, and so I drove that thing basically sitting with my butt you know, half in the chair oh. and half out of the chair. So when I got to the ST, which they had there, I was kind of grumpy about it. But the, the thought oh. I had about like Porsche nowadays is it's all about FOMO, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, the, the 911 comes out and you're like, oh, I got to get one of those. And then all of a sudden, oh, that's not good enough. You got to get the GT car, right? And then, oh, that's not good enough. You got to get the GT3. And then, oh no, you got to get the RS. And then, oh no, you got to get the ST. And I kind of feel like BMW had this moment in the 80s where they went from being yes. kind of the car that people knew about that was a really great driver's car to becoming kind of the car that like everybody lusted after. And I feel like Porsche is having that moment now. And I'm not really sure that's a good thing for the brand because I always felt like, like you said, Matt, they were, you know, a car for the attainable every man. And now they're not. Well, I think it ha it's, it it happens. I mean, you're right. Even BMW, BMWs in the early 2000s were, I think, sort of the top of the line. You know, if you talk about the M3 just as being an iconic car that every banker in New York wanted at the time, BMW was the car to have. And now it's Porsche and it's not going to last forever. Ever. Everything goes in, in a, a season and cycle. And I think Porsche really is gunning to become like Ferrari in terms of um, how it's valued and the margins and, and how it's collected. And uh, that's why they're pushing this, like you say, this FOMO culture, which is, I agree, it's not good for the brand. Ultimately, it ends up making people resent the brand and feel like they're being taken advantage of, you know, and nobody likes that feeling. Yeah, as, a, as a side note, um, we got an email from a listener Last week, Hannah, um, who is a big car collector out here on the East Coast, and he's got amazing vehicles, including like a 1930s Packard V12. So that kind of thing, right? Um, million dollar cars. And he uh, told us the first new car that he's been interested in in 20 years was the new M2. And he ordered one and got Interesting. one. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. And it's a, a great car. I mean, nobody's at the top forever. It's only like, no matter what, it's only a matter of time. Things change. Where has Audi been the last few years? Basically nowhere. But at some point, we're going to start talking about Audi again. You know, things things change. It's just seasons. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we we don't um, we don't live in that rarefied air that much. You know, we're, we're kind of down 
done more with the uh, Corollas and Camrys of the world. Uh, uh, and that's fine. Uh, I think, you know, our, our strength has always been trucks. And man, I know, like you just said, one of your favorite trucks is you're a big truck guy. Have, have you driven the Raptor R and the TRX? Have you been able to, you know, get yes. of those two? What do you think? Yeah, I, well, I mean, they're awesome. Um, I, I drove the TRX when I first came back to the U.S., uh, two years ago, and I was blown away because I hadn't driven one of the new Rams, you know, with the new very luxurious interiors. And obviously the power plant is insane. I love a supercharger much more than I, uh, it, it, much more emotion, I think, for me with a supercharger than a tur than turbochargers. Um, and then I was able to drive, I owned a Raptor in 2014, and I was able to drive the new Raptor with the EcoBoost first, and I was frankly, very disappointed. I'm, I'm not a fan of that uh, power plant. And then I drove the Raptor R, which is amazing. You know, it's a screamer. Um, but for me, I just, I, I don't need that much power. I mean, I'll, I'll have it for sure, but I'm not going to buy, buy it for a hundred and however many thousand dollars. And, uh, in a big truck, I just prefer the Duramax or the power stroke or the Cummins. I mean, the diesel gives me a a very luxurious feeling. It's got so much push um, that I, I don't need the the ho screaming high RPM uh, uh, horsepower in, in a big truck. Yeah, I have a question about the Raptor, Matt. Sorry to, to break in here, but um, is the Raptor, could you say that's Ford's halo vehicle? For, sh way? for sure. I mean, other than the GT, right? Which um, you know, if you watch Bring a Trailer you, you, lately, you just see so many GTs uh, and a lot of them going for multiple hundreds of thousands or even a million bucks. The the Raptor, I think, is really the halo vehicle for their for their main audience. Um, and it's it's a beast. I, I love I loved the week that I got to spend in the Raptor. I love the week I got to spend in the Bronco Raptor. Um, but they're so expensive and they're so difficult to get that uh, I think a lot of people, and this is the point of a halo vehicle, are happy to settle for one step lower. The problem for me is one step lower on the F-150 is a V6. I know you can get the five liter, but it's just not as good as, you know, the 6.2 liter that you can get in a Chevy truck or the Hemi that you that you could get in the Rams. Um, and I, I'm a huge fan of the straight six, the Hurricanes, um, that that Rams come out with now, but I'm just not a fan of the the Ford V6. Hey, I wanted to ask you guys before we wrap this up real quickly. Uh, obviously, we're living in this huge change where we're going from well, I thought we were going from internal combustion to electrification, but now the winds are blowing definitely the, the other way. Um, why is that? Why do people hate electric cars so much? You know, we've we've had we've owned four Teslas. And depending on what you want to do with them, they are very good vehicles. Uh, and Tesla is not, of course, the only electric brand. Why is all this hate now on electric vehicles? We do an electric vehicle review, and I would say nine out of the ten comments are are uh, just you know this is this this is horrible. This is un-American. This is you know will never last. It's unreliable. Uh, and, and I'm just I'm just wondering where all that's coming from because I like to look at a vehicle not based on my politics but based on you know how you use it and how you need it. Are you guys seeing the same thing out there? Yes, yes, majorly. I think when you ask that question, two things come to my mind. The first is people are frustrated with the the charging network, and you know it is a real thing that even in Los Angeles, which probably has the most chargers of any area in the country, often they are broken, they don't work, or you're waiting in line. Um, you know, last last week I drove to Las Vegas and I don't think there's an electric vehicle that could have made the drive without having to charge, or maybe I could have arrived on fumes, but then it's like you have to go straight to a charger. It's it's stressful. <laughs> It's yeah. stressful. Yeah. So that's the number one thing. And then the other thing, and Matt, I know you can comment on both. The bottom line is EVs have become political. And I think that's too bad, but it's just, it's ex extremely true that they are political now. And it, you're making a s political statement with how you feel about EVs and whether or not you drive one, I think. Yeah, no, I hate the politicization of EVs. And I think that's just down to the fact that so many people just want to play in this polarized uh climate you know 
it's almost like uh, choosing your favorite football team. Um, and they don't inform themselves and they just rant on forums. Like I spent a lot of time in the challenger forum cause I have a scat pack. And of course it's a hugely political hot potato there. Um, but I think there are real, uh, there are real practical problems with EVs. There are amazing vehicles, you know, and since the Tesla came out, it's been awesome in terms of the acceleration. Um, we've all learned about, you know, torque goes uh, just like an on off switch. But um, the the battery degradation is a question that I think a lot of people are worried about. You know, if I buy a gas powered vehicle or a diesel vehicle, it's not going to lose range over the course of five or six years, whereas an electric vehicle will. The infrastructure is awful. I mean, it's just horrendous. And um also, it just takes so long to charge if you have good infrastructure, uh, if you're going on a long trip. So I, you know, I spent a week in the Kia EV9 a couple weeks ago, and it was amazing. My wife was like, buy it right off the bat, you know, um, so roomy, so uh, perfectly functional. It's got all the luxury things that you would want or need, and you can fit everything in it. Uh, it it's fun to drive. It looks kind of cool. But at the end of the day, I'm just not willing to have a battery that's going to uh, you know, lose power and value and, uh, and a vehicle that I have to, at least on trips, charge, um, at some, uh, unreliable places. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. We did this thing where we tried to establish, uh, um, kind of a, a cannonball run, legal cannonball run. So we did two runs from Disney to Disney. So we went from Anaheim to Orlando, um, and on the second run, I got to drive the, our Tesla back, which is still 2,500 uh, 2, miles from Orlando. And you're exactly right. Uh, I was in St. Louis. I had to really go to the bathroom. And, you know, Tesla does this cool thing where it shows you where to stop and for how long to stop you need to charge. And it, and it pulled me into this, like, industrial park in St. Louis. And the only thing that, that was there to use as a bathroom was an indoor dog park. <laughs> So, so I, I had to go to the indoor dog park and I really had to pee. And they're like, oh, by the way, if you want to come in here, you got to fill out this form and, and, and sign this form so you don't sue us. And I'm like, for fuck's sake, I just want to use the bathroom. I don't care if a you dog takes a nip at me. But that's the world we live in right now. You know, it's it, you're exactly right. It's it's not there. Uh, and it's it seems to be not getting better, unfortunately, which is also kind of mind uh, mind blowing. Well, well, I think hybrids are the way forward. Like hybrids is a great way. I've always thought there's no replacement for displacement, and obviously that statement can be true or not, depending on what you want out of a car. But uh, an electric battery, adding electric power, is a great way to make a smaller, more efficient engine more exciting to drive. Um, also, if you're worried about the environment, you can drive on electric power almost all the time and only use um, the gas engine occasionally. I mean, the Ram, the new Ram Charger that Andre uh, just did a video with, to me, is super exciting. You know, I don't know why BMW did away with the range extender and the i3s and the i8s. Like, it made a lot of sense to me. You know... I know Matt loves hybrids and he this is his this is his soapbox but I would gently point out that I had a hybrid Mercedes this week and we're going to talk about this later um that it was an AMG V8 hybrid and it got 15 miles per gallon in the city but was it fun to drive so, Yes it was fun to drive but my point is just because it's a hybrid does not mean this is some wildly efficient machine. I mean, 15 miles per gallon is horrible. And I would say, if you really want to be environmentally friendly, just don't buy new th things. That's, don't consume. Don't be a consumer. That's Use a, old things. That's a great point. That's Hannah nice. makes it a lot. So and nice. I love it. And obviously, you know, Hannah buys classic buy vehicles. Stuff. I will yeah. say that my wife just got finished a two-year lease with a Volvo uh, XC90 T8 which has, you know, the little four cylinder and battery power at the end of our lease. She put about 10, th had put about 10,000 miles in total on the family hauler. And we filled it up maybe four times, you know, because almost That's all impressive. of the driving that she does is just around town and she comes home and plugs it right back in. So it's almost never needed gas. I think that the AMG hybrid is a very different kind of hybrid than you know, the Volvo. Admittedly so. Yeah. Yes, admittedly so.
But you know, that's where it's going. Like this Lexus GX behind me, the hybrid version is more for power than it is for fuel economy. Same thing with the new Tacoma. Uh, you know, same thing with yeah. many of the new Toyotas. Not the Prius, obviously, and not the, you know, the, the more traditional Toyotas. But yeah, they're using it to get more power, not necessarily more fuel economy. Well, guys, I, I really want to thank you for coming on the show. Um, and uh, I guess if, we're, if you want to learn more about this GX, from my point of view, Head on over to Hot Pursuit because we're taping two of these uh, where I get to now kind of answer some questions, um, whatever you guys want to throw at me. Awesome. Thanks so thank much for so having much, us. Thank you so much, Roman. Really yeah, a thank, pleasure. Thank you, guys. Really fun talking to you.